Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would love to introduce my wonderful co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. Good. How are you? Welcome, Welcome back. back. Listen, I haven't done a chief chat and since Feb February 28th was the last day I did a chief chat. Isn't that crazy? It's wild. It's <laughs> <laughs> real. Well, before we get started with, I just want to let you guys know that you all did a wonderful job hosting the show for the past uh, you know, three months. Uh, I got a chance to watch it after the fact, and you all should absolutely get your show. I'll be your co-host uh, whenever, whatever that is, whatever the format is. If it's a beauty consult thing, I got you. I'm on the show. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is a retired Army Special Forces veteran who served in Afghanistan and Iraq as a horse soldier. The retired Master Sergeant joins us today to discuss his military career and give a military exclusive look at his entrepreneurial success. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Scott Neal. Hey. 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 Well, thanks, thank you thanks for joining us, Scott. Me. Yes, thank you for inviting me. You know, I'm so happy uh, to be part of this. I have so many AFI stories as a young soldier in the beginning of wars. Uh, you know, I'm really tickled uh, just to be here to chat with you today. Awesome, awesome. And it's a pleasure having you with us today. You know, um, there's a, a lot of things probably people have misconceptions about uh, military members uh, on horseback because that seems like so a uh, civil war time frame and so we'll, we'll get into all that good stuff but can you let us can you let us get um can you let us know where you're joining us from today so right now i'm currently in tampa florida uh i retired out of here from mcdill air force base the headquarters of special operations awesome that's awesome and and, so and it's beautiful and sunny Florida, Oh, I bet. We can't wait. We, we, like Chief said earlier before we jumped on, we'll all be there next week. So we are looking forward to it. Um, and first and foremost, um, we would like to thank you so much for your service and your sacrifice. Um, and what inspired you to join the military? And what was your military um, career goal from the very beginning? I knew as a young kid, uh, I wanted to join the military. I watched every more, you know, think about the old days. There was the John Wayne war movies, the, the longest day and the green berets, all of this stuff. I played cowboys and Indians. I actually had a scholarship for acting, uh, in high school and I turned it down and went right to the recruiter. So I joined in 1986, uh, just regular, uh, infantry. And, you know, I, my career goal was to live a life of adventure. So when you're so young, you don't know what that means, a life of service. Yes, you're a patriot. Yes, you're American. But really, um, you want to know what to do uh, for your country. And at the end of my career, I got to do so many unbelievable things with unbelievably great Americans and our allied partners. Uh, it was a great adventure. Now, and speaking of that great adventure, you deployed to Afghanistan and hunted down the Taliban and Al Qaeda with some members of your special forces group on horseback. So how did you prepare for that mission and what are your most vivid memories of navigating Afghanistan as a Green Beret? So remember 9-11 was very sudden. Nobody knew it, but I was a member of the fifth special forces group. So our area of operation was the Middle East. Um, It was literally, uh, we don't know what to do. We just need to send some members behind the lines along with our agency partners. You could see some of the older photos uh, of us. It, it, America needed its response. One of those photos is actually the Bin Laden terrorist training camp. You could see all the obstacles. Others, you could just see it was, you know, as, as 
do what you can to respond to us being attacked. Uh, the horseback part, that was part of uh, one of the special forces teams as uh, unconventional warfare. That means when you fight with the Mujahideen fighters, you fight, you live with them, you eat what they eat. In the beginning, uh, uh, you kind of went in uniform and after a while you just adapt to how you need to survive in the environment. And luckily for us, uh, we had our wits and skills and our Afghan partners uh, that kept us alive, basically. So, so how was your horse horse riding skills prior to being a, a Green Beret? <laughs> so I grew up in Central Florida on some working uh, cattle ranches as a young kid. My grandfather ran a lot of the rodeos. Um, most of the guys, all they had was basically quarter horse training, and that is the quarters you put in those little horses in front of the Walmarts and grocery stores. That was it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mark and Bob, who were really the commanders of the Special Forces team, Mark was the only one that had horse riding skills. He had a rodeo scholarship, and in ROTC, he studied all those old cavalry battles. So we had no clue that anybody... Uh, would be on horseback during that time. Yeah, that was sorry. Um, I have the mower who decided to show up right now, so uh, I have a <laughs> no, little bit of good. a background noise. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, we um, I got a chance to go to um, oh my goodness, what was I? I went to um, they were training the the, it's kind of like the Honor Guard in the Air Force, but they they do the the the, the horseback right, and I was talking to. Uh, a sergeant first class, not a sergeant first class, a specialist. I talked to a specialist and I asked him, okay, so how much did you know about horses before they trained you? And he's like, well, I'm from California. I've never seen a horse before. And so, and then now the army trained him up to, to, to ride horses. And, and actually he was training other folks on how to ride horses. So it's just, it's just crazy how you can just come from an environment where you, that's something that you're not even familiar with at all. And then you become a pretty much an expert in it. Well, well, you have to learn and adapt quickly, and that's what makes uh, um, all of our special operations forces so unique because literally nobody knew that was the method of getting around Afghanistan. Uh, not only was it horseback, all of a sudden you had to move around in these old Toyota vehicles. You know, you, you just had to do all the arrays of these special operations missions. Now, the horses themselves they were, were left over from when the Mongols had uh, moved into Afghanistan. So they weren't full-size horses like you would think in Western movies. They were very, very short. Think a little bigger than a Shetland pony. And to imagine to see these Americans, all of us six foot tall and 200 pounds uh, on these horses, uh, it was quite a sight, especially when the Afghans maybe weighed 120 pounds right and most of them were five foot two uh it was quite an awkward almost circus like uh uh <laughs> event to watch uh, a bunch of special operators on a horse but at the end mark and bob and some of the other members that really raised the horse cavalry they went from 30 horsemen the first day to 350 horsemen to by the third week had went from village to village and had 3,500 horse cavalry. Now my mission wow. was slightly different. Uh, I had to go a lot even further behind the lines because at the time we were uh, preparing our Mujahideen fighters and some of us were going behind the lines to kill or capture some very senior Al Qaeda members. So we all did this in unison uh, not only Green Berets, but we had SEALs, we had our Air Force combat controllers, we had Air Force weathermen, um, we had female aviators overhead. It really was a joint operation during that time. That's awesome, awesome. So um, at the exchange, as you know, uh, our motto is we go where you go. And so yes. we've served so many deployed troops at our mobile field exchanges. We offer a little taste of home while you're out you know, on your mission, favorite member of the exchange while you're deployed to Afghanistan? Well, it started as we were building up to go into Afghanistan. Uh, we were at a secret location. Uh, and one of the things that, as you said, follows you is AFI. So how do you bring 
um, you know, where you're just eating in a remote location, you're preparing for battle. You obviously couldn't bring anything with you when you first came over. And then uh, there was a little AFI store that popped up and they provided all the comforts and licky chewies, those little snacks mm -hmm. that uh, put you to bed at night. When we finally went into Afghanistan, we only ate with our Mujahideen fighters, so there was no foods. And I think we would we would share one MRE packet for about 10 people. And so we mm. lost a tremendous amount of weight during that time frame. And um, I remember one of our soldiers were shot and had to be taken back to the rear with a special forces medic. And the next day the medic said, hey, be prepared. Uh, I met an APES rep, and they're not able to get into country yet, but he's going to outfit us with some supplies. And when he showed up the next day, there was a full pallet loaded with all of these supplies that APES wasn't able to get into Kandahar yet because it wasn't cleared. And that became our first, imagine, it had been a, a hard battle. We had lost 30 pounds each. And then our medic, we were very sad that one of our um, teammates were injured, but then he comes with this big AFI care pallet. And uh, it was a hit that night at the um, Kandahar Air Base with all the commanders, everybody. We threw the biggest bonfire. I think we were high on sugar and Coke and candy bars and baby <laughs> roofs and socks and, and all of the home supplies. That was the beginning of 9-11. And, you know, of course, we fought throughout uh, Iraq uh, many times back into Afghanistan and to watch the footprint. And finally, um, my last bit of service overseas was a 10th year anniversary in the Kandahar and to see the size of the AFI's footprint, to see young soldiers who it was their first time in combat, you know, mirror what they had on their bases uh, from their hometowns where they were stationed it was just an, a sight to see yeah well i mean we we can't have you guys losing weight out there so bring aphids when you want to uh, pack on some pounds baby let's <laughs> it, it, we coming we're coming to save the day <laughs> and, and you know it, it is you know i grew up 25 years of service uh, i remember the invasion of panama but we had aphids there you know in some of the bases in panama at the time so it's funny getting ready for these situations. And uh, once again, before we even left Fort Campbell for Afghanistan, I think we bet bought every aisle of tactical gear at the time. If you think about it, Garmin had just came out and all we had was like one GPS per person. And we went to AFES and just scooped, you know, everything out, all the hunting gear, fishing gear. We really didn't know what we were going to do in Afghanistan and uh, AFES kind of became that pre-deployment supplier for us. Uh, uh, we didn't take as much sugar back then because we were healthy tactical athletes, but uh, we, we sure ate it when it came in on that pallet uh, in, in probably, I think it was December of 2001. Yeah. So I got a chance to go to Europe uh, probably about a little bit over a month ago, um, and I got a chance to see all of our AFES operations from the, the biggest one at Ramstein, if you've ever been to that one, it's freaking huge and massive all the way. And I got a chance to go to Poland and and, and Poland, we're, we're building up in Poland. And I got a chance to see us literally uh, drive a van to a remote location and sell stuff out of a van. I know it sounds a little sketchy when I say it out loud, but but it, it was actually like no. these are the type of uh, this, this is the scope that AFES kind of brings to the fight, which is which is awesome. Well, I think number one, what does AFES provide, you know, in the home base, it's, it's the continuity of, you know, quality products and things for the family and, you know, things that get you through the field exercise. When you're forward deployed, um, you know, the monotony of the meals ready to eat and the mess hall uh, are, you know, going to AFES and kind of finding those comforts that uh, keep you American and keep you sane at times uh, become important because the families don't know exactly what to send to you. So God bless them. You know, I remember my mom and, and all of the aunts trying to send us massive boxes of things you didn't need. 
right? Uh, they thought yeah, exactly. you need, but you probably didn't need it. And then, you know, the reality of just going to AFES, I still have all of my plastic and uh, paper coins. The pogs? You know what I mean? Because, yeah, the, the pogs, pogs, right? Yeah. And I read pogs. about oh, them yeah. in World War II and all these other things. And, uh, you know, there's not one combat deployment I have that uh, AVs haven't been a part of. And I think I still have a lot of items that I've purchased uh, in my old foot lockers uh, still today. I can't wait till I pass them on to my kids and they go through and uh, wonder what the heck this is and that is. I said, compliments of AVs. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And so, Scott, um, your group was prepared um, to deploy to the Middle East one week prior to 9 11. Um, the mission was documented in the 2018 film 12 Strong, which yeah. stars Chris Hemsworth, Rob Riggle, yeah. Michael Shannon, and Michael Pena. How closely did the film mirror your experience? Um, you know, none of us participated in the making of the movie, first of all. So imagine, you know, this is a story about a time and place we all remember, but didn't know the circumstances of America's response. First of all, uh, we all giggled how Chris Hemsworth uh, was chosen to play Mark. Uh, I think his daughters instantly <laughs> changed their screen savers to Chris Hemsworth or like Mark is out of the picture. Uh, but, you know, there's some aspects. One is um, nobody, we weren't present at uh, New York or um, the Pentagon or so we watched it on the news like everybody else. So when you see everybody standing in the mess hall watching this unfold, that was true. Um, number two, Mark had left the team. So there are some elements that are true. And then there's elements that Hollywood, you know, as a service member, you're like, wow, I didn't remember having 10,000 bullets in that magazine, uh, you know, <laughs> shooting at the enemy. I think what it tried to portray was the toughness of Afghanistan. These people had nothing. They had one or two bullets. Um, the Taliban were brutal. And you see the scene where they're beating a school teacher that is the truth of the austereness of Afghanistan and to be given this mission and, you know, to be injured on horseback. The, the part that's not true is Bob wasn't blown up. Uh, I think Michael Shannon had to go do another Hollywood movie. So they made it look like he got blown up. Um, but all in all, at the time, there hasn't been a good special forces movie. Now there's been lots of seal movies. And for some reason, a whole bunch of CIA movies, but uh, we're very proud that uh, they finally got a great Green Beret movie. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what they didn't depict was the Air Force contribution with the combat controllers, right? So Hollywood, eh, the truth of the remoteness and a brave mission with brave soldiers when nobody expected us to survive, that part they got right. Well, the Air Force got Tyrese and Transformers, so I think I think we're we're even. You know, I, I saw those movies. I'm like, wow, you know, C5. I didn't know we had so many C5s. But it's hard, as you know, being in the military and watching a military movie. Uh, it, oh but, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of cr critique. It, it is, but you know, there's been a few other documentaries, and you know, the truth is. You know, at any one time in the country today, there are military members, special operators, uh, men and women in 55 countries uh, supporting America's mission. And there are a lot of stories you won't ever see a movie written about or made from. And that's OK, um, because we're the quiet professionals. We just get the job done for the country and come home to our families. So Scott, after your time in Afghanistan, you worked with the Green Beret mm -hmm. Foundation. So can you tell us yes. more about your leadership with the foundation, as well as what kind of inspired your support of veterans um, personally, but also professionally? Um, I think once you leave service, you, you have this big hole. How do I contribute? You know what I mean? You, you were contributing to the country's business. Now I'm on the sidelines. And you see a lot of veterans today either starting, volunteering, 
or uh, employing with a veterans nonprofit. Of course, being a longtime Green Beret, I knew the leadership. I knew the senior enlisted leadership. I also had the advantages of understanding business and business leaders. So my contribution was combining the need for resources that um, the, the command wasn't able to support. And I, we raised a lot of money and awareness because Green Berets were very secretive at the time and the community just didn't know. There was a lot of money for a lot of other great nonprofits, but we needed to focus on our community and the Green Berets were suffering 70% of the casualties of the force because we were so far you know, out of, in front of everything. So we, we not only helped family members, we helped recovering Green Berets, but we also designed a program that taught retiring and uh, transitioning Green Berets how to start a business. And there was a lot of programs for injured, but it wasn't teaching how to take all of those skills and discovering what your passion was, how to live the American dream you had been defending and that's what started me on my journey. It was called the next ridge line. How are you going to get from here to that next ridge line and be successful? And uh, that's what started me on my entrepreneurial journey. Man, that's awesome and, and super. So that's awesome that you're giving giving back and, and continue to serve yeah. uh, after you, after you take the uniform off. And so, uh, but during, during your time uh, in prior and following Afghanistan. You, and you mentioned Mark uh, a few times, uh, but Mark Nooch, who was a the horse soldier and team captain. Yeah. How did you know what 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 about Mark? Uh, kind of you knew like this is gonna be my bro for life, and this is gonna be my future business partner. Uh, Mark and I, Special Forces is very 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 small. Think cul de sac. You know everybody's yes. business. Our wives take care of each other. Uh, when you depart, our kids grew up and are still friends today. Um, it doesn't stop. So, Mark, uh, you know, we combined missions in Iraq. Um, we, you know, stayed friends because we lost good friends together. So you see each other at different wakes and events. You see each other at ceremonies. Mark took a path of government uh, service in one direction. I came to the headquarters of special operations. You know what I mean? You, you, you kind of get older together and then your kids who grow up together or the glue sometimes and the wives who are great friends. And when I left service, um, Mark and I, Mark had wanted to help the Afghans and was in country and he was helping schools and he reached out and I went to community schools and got all of those old kindergarten to third grade workbooks and we shipped them over in a pallet. So you never leave. You never leave where you served. You never leave who you served. And today, Mark and I and a lot of our friends who served together are in this business that we're working together too. You can see my hand motions, right? You never military. Oh, yeah. You always have the knife hand, <laughs> right? And you have the oh, yeah. hand motions yeah, like the map behind me. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, um, as you know, entrepreneurship is um, one of the um, avenues for service members to take yes. after ending their military career. Mm -hmm. When did you mm -hmm. realize that you wanted to expand your professional experience into entrepreneurship? Uh, Green Berets are this country's expeditionary entrepreneurs. And what I mean by that is an entrepreneur, if you were to define one, is somebody that takes risks, chances, has very little resources, uh, but has a clear focus on how to drive and be successful. That was the formula that if you take that kind of person and you put them into the business economy, how do we enable them to be successful? So I knew from a long time that I didn't want to sit at a desk. I knew more than anybody else around me. That's that false sense of I, I can get it done. And when we started this business, we started in a business we knew nothing about, which meant that we were all equally um, on the same level. And we applied all of those military skills. And it took us two years before we really got this business up and running.
So as a veteran, in hindsight, what transferable skills or insight from your time in the military has helped you develop and grow into this business? Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. So as a veteran, in hindsight, what transferable skills or insight from your time while you served in the military has kind of helped you and you know, and Mark develop and grow your current business into what it is today? Number one, you know, on the intel side, you take all of these functions you learned in the military, intelligence, preparation, planning, those all became the skills we needed. So I like to call it knowledge dominance. Know everything about the business, know everything about your competitor, know everything about your product, then have a plan and execute the plan precisely. And I can definitely show you the business plan we came up together in 2015 is the same format and the same um, guidance we're using today. So I was very surprised when I left the military that I thought I was, I hate to say, ignorant on business. Now that I've been in this business for eight years, I could say that everything that formed me and formed this company along with the friends that I served with is all the skills I gained in my military service. We're frugal. Uh, we use limited resources. Um, we're tireless you know, in pursuing excellence. The wives are part of this business. The kids you know, are part of this business. Um, I'm proud to say that we're successful because of who we were. And we use those skills to get to where we are today. Yeah, and, and I always kind of talk to my friends about uh, if you really kind of sit back and look at our military experience as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and especially if you're sitting at the commander, uh, senior enlisted leader kind of level, yeah. if you look across the, the bow, you look at like, okay, we got a logistics section, we got a HR section, we got a finance section, we got all these different areas that help run a unit. And I'm like, that's that's a business. Like we're, we're, we're running yeah. businesses. Yeah, yeah, but the taxpayers are giving us the finances to do it but but that we're actually executing this business and not even realizing it you're exactly right um you know now i had to learn from the bottom up and you as a senior enlisted advisor you you had to walk the path that your soldiers sailors airmen you know everybody in your organization to understand what they're going through and what they should be delivering so i'm glad i started as an entrepreneur and I didn't leave service and then I became employed as a senior member of an organization I knew nothing about. I had to take out the trash, right? I had to understand um, you know, all of the cost of goods and funding and financing. The part um, I felt became the most important part was understanding money. Because we were resourced by Congress and we were given budgets by commands and staffs um, sometimes, you know, I remember going in Afghanistan with four million dollars, right? Here you go. Here's a bundle of money. Be responsible. Uh, and now how do I find money? And that became um, probably my biggest gap in education. Now I've went through multiple business transactions. We have multiple funding, financing partners. We have banking relationships. Um, I had to learn very fast on the engine of business and that is money 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 Absolutely. our discussions every day are about spending it uh invoicing for it and finding more resources uh money 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 absolutely and so we got a bunch of service members and family members out there uh -huh. kind of watching this uh, and what kind of words of wisdom do you want to give them to kind of if they want to kick start a small business or want to start their in entrepreneurial entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, is there any kind of words of wisdom or advice you want to give? First of all, gray hair, right? <laughs> uh, nobody cares like you care about your idea, right? Practice, start a business, it may fail. It's okay. Start one on the weekend, have a job and, and dream about something you want to do. Next is knowledge dominance. I watched a thousand videos on how to start a business the next phase of business. Second is connect and network. Don't be afraid. Uh, support your wife or your spouse or your child if they want to start a business. You don't have to wait till you retire um, to, to get something going and you're going to learn. I have about four businesses before this 
that are great ideas. Um, I just wasn't ready. And when we found this one, it took off. One day, if this business is successful, I'll bring up another business. Entrepreneurism is a way of life. Start early, start often, start one with a friend, and uh, one will be successful when three won't be. But don't don't ever give up. Um, it'll always be there for you. It's a skill set and a mindset. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And Scott, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing um, your uh, military experiences and also your business yeah. savvy. Um, so what <laughs> other projects are you working on right now? Uh, besides our business, uh, which is all consuming, um, we love to have adventures. We are like Peter Pan's. Our wives just shake their head every time we get together and might have a glass of bourbon. Um, so earlier, earlier this year, we went and we got recertified at the Special Forces Dive School, and we worked with the Defense Department Personnel Accountability Agency, and we dove in Saipan. It's a joint project where uh, active service members, university members, and retired veterans, and we uh, dove on a World War II aircraft wreck and tried to recover the pilot's remains. Uh, next year is the 80th anniversary of D-Day. We, on the 75th anniversary, we got together, went back through airborne school, and we jumped into the opening ceremonies of the 75th. So this year, uh, we're planning already a year out, and we're going to jump into Normandy. And as you know, 80 years ago was this, you know, world-changing event. And some of our older veterans, World War II veterans, may probably will not be alive by then. So we want to carry on and commemorate prior service, right, with this current generation of veterans, with new service members who may not have served in Afghanistan or Iraq. So we figure this is a great time to uh, the world stage and uh, our wives are shaking their head. You fools are too old to be jumping out of airplanes. Uh, but, you know, it's in our heart. We got to do it. And the wives go over. They dress in French, you know, maiden outfits. We have wine and cheese on the drop zone. It's going to be a great time. And, yes, we'll be visiting our, our friends and AFIs in England and Germany, kind of the lead up. Uh, to the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Now, now I, I don't think we've mentioned uh, your, your current business that you're working on. I, ah. We definitely want to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we definitely want... We, we definitely can uh, at I'm least talk about that. it a little bit. Um, it is in AFES, and thank you very much. Uh, we are a veteran-owned business. We make a bourbon called Horse Soldier Bourbon. Um being in Kentucky for so long, of course, the history of Kentucky and the history of soldiers coming home from war and starting a business, uh, we chose bourbon. And, and this business has taken us to tell our story of service and entrepreneurism all over the country. We do almost 500 events a year from whiskey and war stories to bottle signings. Uh, we are, uh, as a matter of fact, we're in several AFI stores this week. Um, what a great partnership it's been, but, um, you know, it, 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 we started with nothing. We had no money. Our wives designed the label. Our kids licked it. That's why the labels are crooked. You, you know, it's like, ah, oh, come on, kids. We got to get better at this. <laughs> at the end of the day, it is, it is the business we get to pass to our children, right? It's not the footlocker full of old war medals and dirty boots. It's the American dream achieved and realized. So that is the message we uh, give everybody when we talk to members of our community. Is, it is true. This country is so good that you could start something with nothing, with a group of friends who serve together. And uh, we want to be known for what we're doing today more than we were known for what we did in the past. And, and that's what we're doing. And it's delicious. I I, I gotta say, it's not bad. <laughs> well, Scott, it's been a pleasure learning more about you and your experiences you. as well as your business today. Um, Thank where you. can our viewers go to keep up with you and all of your business endeavors? 
Um, you can see our Misfit Adventures, uh, obviously, horsesoldierbourbon.com, our social media. Yes, we have Twitter. Uh, we have uh, all of the different um, sites you can go to from LinkedIn to um, Instagram. You know, we, we love to showcase America. And we're so glad that um, you're sharing uh, our business with everybody today, too, as well. Absolutely. And, uh, and for our Chip Chat viewers, you can uh, view this episode. Uh, it's available on YouTube, so you can always rewatch this yes. with your friends or catch up with past episodes. Uh, and be sure to join us back here at 11 a.m. Central on Wednesday, June 14th, when we welcome former Fort Belfort Commander, decorated war veteran, yep. W. Amputee actor and speaker, retired Colonel Gregory Gadsden. Uh, join us again at 11 a.m. Central on Tuesday, June 20th, when we have professional motorsports racing driver, uh, race driver uh, Casey Curry to join the chat. So Scott, it's been a pleasure having you with us today, and thank and, uh, and thank you because for me, I, I'm I'm about maybe 14 months left in this uh, in in the military, and just knowing that you know there there's there's a another other side to this. You know, I've I've had a blast in my military career. Yes, uh, so many great experiences, met so many great people, but just to know that there is there is a kind of a life beyond the military that that you can continue to, to serve others uh, just in a different capacity. So thank you for sharing that information with us. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, I, I wish you well on your journey. I'm sure we'll cross paths. I think the veterans are now starting to connect as entrepreneurs and business owners like our, you know, grandfathers and fathers did when they returned home. And that's the most important thing. You're not doing this alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you don't mind hanging on until after the live so we can kind of say our yeah. formal goodbyes. But I just want to say, I guess, thank you for your service and your sacrifice to the country. Um, it means so much that, you know, spend a little bit of time with us. And we wish you all the best in all your all your future endeavors. Thank you very much. You guys have a very blessed day. Awesome. Awesome. And Chief Chat out. <laughs>